For more exclusive content from CNBC Crypto Trader, hit the subscribe button now. Crypto Trader is proudly brought to you by eToro. Discover a simpler way to trade and invest in cryptocurrencies and more. Coverage of New York Blockchain Week is brought to you by CGCX, the world's first crypto exchange that's insured against cyber attacks and hacks. Last year, at exactly this time, the market cap was $450 billion, yet everyone was turning bearish. We start our coverage of the New York Blockchain Week right here at Ethereal Summit. Let's see if people are more bullish. Now this is the Ethereal Summit, put on by Consensus, the Ethereum Foundation's enterprise and investment arm, founded and headed up by Joseph Lubin. Here you'll find all things Ethereum, and that's what this episode will focus on. Just look around and you get the distinct impression that the Ethereum community has a great vibe and feel. Across Brooklyn, we're also covering the Fluidity Summit put on by the team at Airswap. There we'll get to speak to Joseph Lubin, but before we go there, let's get some insight from Travis Kling, a former Wall Street trader who teamed up with Timothy Lewis and started Ikigai Capital. He spoke here about where we are in the market cycle. You may want to listen to this. So I'm going to introduce this concept called the Risky Whale. We believe a relatively small number of highly sophisticated, well-capitalized, highly risk-tolerant market participants have been walking this crypto market higher over the sort of seven weeks from, from uh, February through March, and then that was punctuated with these April 1st fireworks. And then on April 1st, we had fireworks, and specifically, what do fireworks look like? Fireworks look like $480 million of BitMEX liquidations in two hours. And just like that, the bottom was in for crypto. We're here at the Ethereal Summit. Joseph Lubin's just been interviewed here behind me, and I've managed to get Travis Kling just off the stage with a very interesting theory. Travis, that was a, one of the better presentations here today. Appreciate it. I want to make sure that I understand what went on there. Are you saying that the bottom's in? For sure. I, I mean, 95%. Yeah, can't be too sure of anything. Okay, so what makes you so confident the bottom's in? Yeah, so... Leading up to April 1st, I think it was less apparent um, and the manner in which the crypto market rallied through January and February and March was um, not a particularly healthy or natural way. You didn't really see quality leading the way. You saw Tron. Yeah, you saw, you saw Tron, you saw Litecoin, you saw a bunch of small cap cryptos that most folks had never heard of. and that that movement sort of dragged the broader crypto market up into the point to get it set up for what we saw on April 1st, which was the fireworks. And was that the official bottom is in day? Yeah, I mean, we thought it was, it, we thought it was basically nail in the coffin prior to that, but that specific event, you know, I think I went from, you know, I don't know, 80% certainty to north of 95% certainty on, on April 1st, yeah. Okay, now, I think you alluded to the fact that there's a group of people, which you call them the risky whales. Yeah. Who are these risky whales? Yeah, well, it's, you can, they are likely individuals or groups of individuals, but um, you can also just think of them as sort of like a heuristic to understand this crypto market as a whole. And uh, it's a group of highly sophisticated, highly risk tolerant, um, well capitalized, crypto investors, uh, they're unlikely to be sort of US-based entities, they're unlikely to be US-located citizens, and it's pretty likely that they are not funds in terms of they don't have outside capital, but they're just doing, they're, they're just sort of investing proprietary capital. Are you saying that these guys manipulated the market to go up? Yeah, I mean, you know, define manipulation. I, I use the word chicanery. Uh, it is. Uh, What's the difference? Maybe not much. Maybe it's just a euphemism for for a manipulation. But it's it's uh, market participants that are willing to find individual situations in the broader crypto market where they can have an outsized effect on the price, and that can be on the upside and to the downside. And this in in, in the earlier uh, uh, months of this year, it was certainly to the upside. And and they pick names like Litecoin and, and smaller cap cryptos that that uh, because of the illiquidity and because of how closely held those names are, they're they're uh, able to be uh, have their price manipulated higher in a way that BTC and ETH just can't. There are 
holders of Bitcoin and market participants that can that can do things to Bitcoin to change the price of Bitcoin, but but the the competing forces on different sides of that are are um, make it a much more sort of true price discovery in in, in, in in BTC relative to other cryptos. So in your mind, we're well the the bear market is well behind us, and yeah. we're now going to the moon. Look, you know. Uh, this presentation I just gave on stage, we talked about this concept of reflexivity a lot, uh, which is a really important uh, uh, topic in, in this asset class. And, um, you know, there was a lot of buyers that had no interest until you had what we call a golden cross, where the 50-day cross is over the 200-day. We had that like two weeks ago. What and is reflexivity? I know a lot of our viewers are watching this and they didn't attend the, the session. So what yeah. is reflexivity? Yeah, so, so reflexivity just means that Market participants' perceptions of the market affect the market, which then in turn change market participants' perceptions. And so there's a circularity to that. And it means that higher prices beget higher prices and lower prices beget lower prices. And, 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 and this reflexivity trait, uh, you see it a little bit in other asset classes, but there is no asset class that, that uh, it, it, it's so present in uh, more than crypto because Crypto derives such a significant portion of its value from network effect, and, and network effect and reflexivity are, are inti intimately related. So you believe that now we're getting this cycle where because prices are going up, prices will continue to go up. It's the same cycle that we had when the prices were going down. Because prices were going down, people started to sell. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And and um, like I said, there's, there's a bunch of buyers that didn't have interest you know, before a golden cross. And then there was a bunch of buyers that didn't have interest until we got back to 6,400, right? Pre-November pre crash levels. And we're knocking on the door of that right now. And then, you know, once that happens, there's a bunch of buyers that may not be interested until we hit 10K. And then there's a bunch of buyers that aren't interested until we hit a new all-time highs. And then you've got, you know, multiple trillions of dollars stuck in traditional wealth management bulge bracket bank products and these guys are like 18 months away from buying so if you're like wondering who's going to buy your bags at 50,000 there's a bunch more capital coming and, and that's reflexivity from your mouth to the man about <laughs> Travis it's been a great pleasure Thanks having for the you time. Time. appreciate it so from ethereal let's head across brooklyn to the fluidity summit interestingly it's set up in an old brooklyn saving bank what a venue and what a talk by Joseph Lubin about all things proof of work versus proof of stake. We caught up with him upstairs about all things Ethereum. Joe, good to see you again. The last time we saw you was actually here. It was exactly a year ago and the market was um, not where it is today. What's happened in the last year? Give me like, the big milestones that have happened in Ethereum in the last year. Big milestones. So the milestones that I care about uh, are all on the, the developer side of things, uh, the infrastructure, uh, building things. Uh, and so uh, milestones are that uh, we're doing a huge amount of work on the enterprise side, uh, building very large scale production systems. Um, uh, just one another of those that uh, um, we'll be able to announce uh, fairly soon. Um, soon, but not today? Certainly not today. I mean, Apologies. You talk about enterprise, and if we look last, at the same time last year, yep. it was all consumer-driven ICOs, and I think the biggest use case back then was surely using Ethereum as a capital raising mechanism. We had a sobering bear market. Um, we seem to have come out the bear market, and you're saying that Ethereum is now maybe shifting a little bit and moving away from this capital raising mechanism. Uh, so Ethereum is many different things. Um, what I was describing uh, was a pretty steady um, growth in the ecosystem and, and my view of the ecosystem is mostly from the developer, the builder perspective. Uh, and so um, speculators move in and out of ecosystems um, based on what they can get from those ecosystems. You say that and I think I agree with you having attended the dev cons and everything yeah. but there was speculation last year that with all the new chains around and some pretty decent chains out there yeah. that the Ethereum development community would actually start deflecting to a, a chain that could accommodate their transaction speeds and their scalability, which currently Ethereum on the proof of work protocol can't do that. Um, have you felt that a slowdown or can you genuinely put your hand on your heart and say, you know, we actually are growing and we still think that we're the dominant chain? Uh, absolutely, by far. The, the uh, Ethereum ecosystem is orders of magnitude bigger than any other ecosystem um, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of developers, in terms of real companies using it. Um, there are uh, projects that uh, consider themselves competitors uh, to Ethereum. Let um, me challenge you on one of those. So 
We've had Binance launching their chain. Now, it's a sure. pretty new chain. And the news headlines that we heard were many tokens deflect or many projects deflect from the Ethereum chain and they're now moving to the new Binance chain. Does something like that worry you? No. No. <laughs> no well, um, a lot of the narrative is driven by challenger projects. A lot of the narrative is supported by journalists uh, who are interested in, uh, in <laughs> clicks, in, in headlines, etc. And so it's boring to say that, uh, that this dominant platform is still this dominant platform and it's growing faster than anything else. It's exciting to say, oh my god, uh, another, a challenger. <laughs> another Ethereum killer. Um, the difference between, um, let's say, a big marketing project uh, and a really big uh, technically deep ecosystem is enormous. Um, the difference between a really strong technical project uh, and a incredibly strong technical project with a really deep ecosystem is enormous. So there, there's some really good technical projects out there, um, but it will take them at least as long to, to get to release as uh, Ethereum 2.0, um, okay, so and then there'll be orders of magnitude behind let's the talk Ethereum about, ecosystem. This is a very small room, but let's talk about the elephant in the room, and that's Ethereum 2.0, and specifically the move to proof of stake. Um, the market's asking, when is this move going to happen? Um, how is this move going to happen? Are we going to run? Are we going to do a hard fork? Is it going to be a two forks running in parallel with with interchangeable tokens somehow? Maybe walk us through the developments around proof of stake. Sure. So it's happening. Um, we know it's happening. We just want to know when. Yeah. Um, the Ethereum 2.0 system called Serenity um, is will be delivered in four phases, three major phases. Um, the three major ones are phase zero, one, and two. Uh, phase zero should be delivered within a few months. Um, there are eight teams uh, that all have working code, so that, that's proof of stake uh, itself, that's Casper. Um, and the teams are now working together to get their code bases in sync. There's a test net uh, for the whole um, group of teams to, to sync up. Uh, so it's very likely that within a small number of months, the actual uh, phase zero will be running uh, and it'll be connected into Ethereum 1.0. So Ethereum 1.0 will keep running um, and Ethereum 2.0 will run in parallel. And the tokens will be somehow yeah, currently duplicated or interchangeable? Currently, token, there's a, a one-way bridge from 1.0 to 2.0 uh, and there's um, discussions and work around making that a, a two-way two, uh, two bridge. And you're talking about so a, it's the same token. And you're talking about a couple of months for this to happen. Um, there's a test net that all teams can can jump on right now. Um, each team has its own test net, and within a few months, I didn't say a couple of months, I said a few months. Um, it really looks like everybody's going to be in sync, and, and the system will be uh, phase zero will be operational. Okay, now, um, I didn't want to talk about price, but you did publish a tweet in December, which was quite profound. I mean, you published a tweet sometime in the middle of December where you said, we've reached the end of the bear market and things are going to turn. I don't remember exactly what the tweet said. And it turned out to be quite prophetic because we're now, the market did turn around about mid-December and we're much higher. Do you think that the FUD has gone and the institutions are starting to take assets more seriously? And to add that, up until now, the big institutional play has been Bitcoin. Whenever you hear of Fidelity launching or somebody else launching, it's always around Bitcoin. Do you think that they're going to start to accept Ethereum soon? So there are systems coming online very soon that will involve the Ether token. Uh, okay. Absolutely. Um, that, that tweet uh, was all about me saying, okay, it's, it's just darkest at this point. Uh, there's just so much FUD. Uh, it can do nothing but get better from here. Uh, and so uh, I was calling a, a depth or a bottom in, in the, the, you degree called the, bottom. Of, I mean, the degree of FUD. The that, one man who doesn't we talk about trading through. actually called the bottom. <laughs> Joe, it's been a great pleasure seeing you again. And we'll catch you again soon. That's Joe. Now let's take a listen to what the attendees had to say. Uh, Fluidity is great. Um, you know, I can feel the excitement. Obviously, we don't like to think a lot about prices, but you know, with Bitcoin going over 6,000 yesterday, I think that there's a sense um, that we might be out of this bear market for a little bit. And so you can just kind of feel the shift in energy 
um, coming here leading into Blockchain Week. I think the market is surprisingly pretty positive right now between the Bitfinex Tether drama and then the Binance hack recently. I was expecting kind of things to not be as hot, but Bitcoin specifically has, has done really well recently and continues to show some pretty positive momentum going into the whole blockchain week we have going on here. Everybody's pretty happy that it's going up. I'm seeing prices are probably going to rise until about 8K over the next six months. And I think we're going to find new resistance levels there. But overall, it's a great time to be back in crypto. And for those of us that stayed, we're seeing renewed hope. I think we're seeing a lot more trade volume. Uh, we're seeing a lot more project in the space. Uh, Bitfinex is raising a billion dollars, and it sounds like they're actually about to raise it for their IEO. Uh, and I think those types of signals uh, are starting to lend a lot more kind of uh, meat uh, in terms of the recovery. Welcome to Banking on the Blockchain. This is their native habitat. Each day, the herd migrates along the concrete plains of Lower Manhattan, searching for the richest, greenest pastures. Pockets heavy and bellies full, theirs is an endless quest to ensure the status quo remains. But a change is coming. Financial evolution is coming. It's time to see the other side of the coin. Now you may remember Chris Berniski, one of the early investors in the space and the guy that wrote a book called Crypto Assets, which became a bestseller in 2016. We caught up with him after his talk. Chris, you just got off the stage, a really bullish presentation. I mean, the numbers that you spoke about were staggering. Talk us through the thesis. Talk us through wh why you think that Bitcoin could become, a, or crypto could become a trillion dollar market. Well, the point of the presentation was to show expectation versus reality. And the graph that I showed of Bitcoin crossing through a trillion dollars by the end of 2021 is really just one potential reality, one potential reality of expectation that we could see. And that was taking uh, Bitcoin's network value from where it is today. And if the path from here to the end of 2021 is half as volatile as the path we went on from May 2015 to the end of 2017, then Bitcoin crosses through a trillion dollars. So really the point is to say, we should expect for the expectation to be insane. And so let's not be surprised when we get there. Even if the media is surprised, even if the newcomers are surprised, this is part and parcel of an innovation like crypto. Now you showed another scenario and you said that you know, if, if, if Bitcoin maintains its dominance then we could actually see a $2 trillion market. Well, that's a way to back into what a potential reality looks like for crypto as a whole, right? Because if Bitcoin's at a trillion dollars, but BTC dominance is at 50%, then it implies that crypto's aggregate network value is $2 trillion. Now we know the Bitcoin dominance index has been falling over time, not because Bitcoin hasn't been growing, but just because the higher risk, more speculative assets grow faster in bull markets. Um, so again, it's just dimensioning what potential future versions of expectation look like so that we are prepared emotionally and intellectually for when we get there. So look, I'm emotionally prepared for a trillion. I'm, I'm a bit more emotionally prepared for two trillion, but let's talk about the reality of where we are today. We're a little bit off the lows. We're trading at about 150, 190 million, 190 billion dollar market cap. And the reality- We've doubled from the lows. We have doubled from the lows. But let's look at the reality, the use of cryptocurrencies. Are you seeing real adoption? Talk me through what's making you so excited about this, this game. I would certainly say Bitcoin continues to be used, right? Um, and we're seeing um, blocks that are as full as they've ever been. Uh, on the programmatic side, the world of decentralized finance is definitely um, showing good signs of traction. For example, one of the graphs I presented today was around MakerDAO. Uh, people think of MakerDAO as a stable coin. I really think of it as a credit facility um, where you lock your ether and you draw collateral uh, or you use that collateral to draw credit against. And so you issue yourself that credit in the form of DAI. And Maker has issued, as of today, over $300 million in loans 
In its first year, it issued over $200 million in loans. For perspective, it took Lending Club five years to issue $250 million in loans. So we see a protocol scaling much faster than a company should, which is part of the thesis and what we should expect with these networks. So that's one example. Are there any other examples? That's a great example to show that this revolution is actually happening faster than any other revolution. Mm -hmm. What other pointers point you in that direction? Well, you can keep going down the decentralized finance stack. Another team that we work with, Numerai. Um, Numerai is a hedge fund that has set up an incentive system to get data scientists to contribute models. Uh, And then Numerai trains a macro model off of those models, which it then uses to manage assets. Uh, You have roughly 200,000 models that have been submitted over the life of Numerai. I don't have the graph here right now, but again, up into the right graph. Um, I showed a graph of AirSwap, one of the uh, sponsors of today's conference, also showing this is purely um, decentralized OTC volumes were 5 million in April. Um, And what's interesting is in 2019, we see those numbers rising, and this is where we're going to see DeFi experience a tailwind as an excitement in the crypto markets heats up because it just naturally forces activity through the decentralized protocols as much as the centralized applications. So it sounds like the bear market didn't shake your spirit. Now, you wrote that book around 2016, 2017. Yeah, I started correctly. writing it in 2016. If you were to write a book again now? I think there's also a book to be written that really speaks to um, this movement as a wealth transfer movement that you know we're not going to see a scale of wealth transfer like this for many decades or potentially centuries to come. And so really communicating the importance to millennials of participating in this wealth transfer is another idea I've had. And I've had other ideas beyond that. It's just a matter of putting in the work necessary to actually write the book. So before we go, I'm gonna ask you one one last question. And I'm not gonna make you do price predictions because we don't do that anymore. When you look forward, do you look for any real risks that could actually really hurt this movement? Long term, I think it's very obvious to me that this technology is superior to creating, custodying, and transferring digital assets than any other technology we have. So the long term 10, 20, 30 year picture is bright. Um, Short term, this is the highest risk asset class you could participate in, right? So if you're participating in, in it, you need to be aware that, yeah, there are tons of regulatory risks, tons of technology risks, tons of social risks, but you are compensated for that risk because it is also the highest return asset class. Because it's going to a trillion dollars by 2020. Potentially. Chris, thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure having you again. Thanks, Ray. Potentially a trillion dollars by 2020. We'll see what happens leading up to the halving. Also at Fluidity was an interesting talk about the evolution of crypto and how users can actually make money on their crypto. I didn't realize there were five ways. So when the critics come out and hit at cryptocurrency, one of the things they hit cryptocurrency on is the fact that you can't make money holding cryptocurrency. But that's all changing, or at least that's according to Tim Ogilvy. Tim, how is that changing? Can you make money holding cryptocurrency? Because I've got a, a whole lot of coins, and I want to make money on those coins. Not all the, not all the coins, but there is a new um, class of, of cryptocurrency that's secured through proof of stake. And if you hold that, you can stake it and earn a yield on it, effectively an interest rate. It can be between 5 and 15% annually. And those are things like Cosmos and Tezos, Dash, Decred, and others. Okay, so now for our viewers who don't understand what staking actually means, when you stake your assets, what actually happens to those assets? So you, you hold on to your assets. So they're actually kept wherever you keep them, on a ledger, or, or, but you participate in proof of stake security. So Bitcoin is secured through proof of work. Proof of stake currencies use what's effectively a voting system. You're voting for an honest participant who runs a node. And if, you, if that person does their job well, you get paid effectively an interest rate in new coins that get minted. Okay, now let's talk about the coins that today you can actually stake. So Tezos is one of them. Right. Let's go through a couple of others. So our company staked supports 11 of them today. It's Cosmos, which is roughly a billion dollars, Dash, Decred, uh, Tezos, Livepeer, EOS, Factum, and a number, a number of others. Okay, now let's talk about how much money you can make on the various coins. Talk to us a little bit about the kind of returns you can make by staking. Well, so, so each, each currency has its own 
uh, rate of return. It's denominated in you get more Cosmos or more Tezzies or things like that, but typically it's between 5 and 15 percent annually. 5 and 15 percent annually. Yep. Okay, so one way of making money is by staking your coins. Yep. How else can I make money by holding sure. cryptocurrency? You can also lend them out. So there are um, short sellers or folks who want to trade on margin who need to borrow crypto assets. And so you can, you can either go through institutional desks that will effectively borrow your currency and pay you anywhere between 2 and 15 percent, depending on how much demand, or there are uh, on-chain smart contracts called Dharma, DYDX, and Compound that will allow you to do that on Ethereum in a completely trustless fashion. Okay, so I can stake my money, I can lend my money to people who want to, my tokens, to people who want to short sell. Yep. How else can I make money if I'm holding tokens? Well, there are some emerging classes where you can, you can provide liquidity effectively to market making algorithms. So Uniswap and Bancor are two of the, the largest here where you put your ETH in and it's then used to effectively uh, make trades when people want to trade assets between ETH and US dollars or things like that. So you're actually funding their working capital. For, you're for funding lack of the working capital for the market maker themselves. No, and that actually has a, a yield that you can look at and, and effectively compare it to lending or staking and decide which of these you want to participate in. Now, how much money can I make by giving my tokens to these? That can be anywhere between as low as 3% annually to as high as, as 10 or 15% annually. Okay, so staking. Uh, it really depends on the activity in the market. And when there's more activity, there's more fees and, and you, make more, you make a higher yield. Staking, lending, liquidity providing. How else can I make money on my token? <laughs> I know there are five ways. There are five ways. I glossed over one which, are, which is providing, uh, investing in work tokens. Things like LivePeer or Augur uh, actually perform network-related services. So LivePeer is a, a video transcoding, and you can you can earn 150 percent more LivePeer token at the end of the day by signing up as a LivePeer transcoder. And actually, we at Staked do all those technical services for you on behalf of a of a holder of LivePeer. Uh, they, and they are in the 150% return. So Filecoin is a great example of that. Filecoin is another one that's launching sh soon. Uh, and, and you effectively stake your coins uh, to participate in Filecoin's distributed file system. OK, what's the last way that I can make money on my cryptocurrencies? Uh, the last way is through payment channel. So Bitcoin is, uh, has something called the Lightning Network. You can put your, your Bitcoin into a Lightning node. And as money passes through it, it effectively collects fees and uh, reduces the number of transactions on the Bitcoin network. And so you can get a, you can get a fee. Currently, those yields are under 1% and it's relatively small. But it's a big area because obviously there's so much Bitcoin and um, the, the yields are effectively shifting from minor subsidies through new inflation to right. it's got to all be out of fees. So we think there's big potential there as well. Okay, now staking is your company. Do you guys do all five or are you guys just a staking mechanism? Currently we really do staking, work tokens and lending. And we've got our eye on how do we help people get into some of the other services like market making liquidity and payment channels. So to the critics out there, now you can see that there actually are five ways that you can make money by just holding cryptocurrency. The video coin network ushers in the new cloud by harnessing underutilized computing resources from around the world to revolutionize the video industry on the blockchain. Powered by a decentralized video ecosystem, it transforms cloud video into an optimized algorithmically driven market. This allows us to deliver revolutionary price efficiencies, much like Airbnb and Uber. Join the video coin revolution at videocoin.io. So those are the five ways that you can make money just holding your crypto. Now let's get to some picks. So we went across town to the west side, on the High Line to the Standard Hotel, where I moderated a big time panel at the day long block fund summit. Here they brought together a whole panel of family officers. I think this is a great way to kick off a week that's going to be a very long week for really anyone sitting in this room. Um, and we've got the pleasure of talking about a very broad topic, which is the market outlook for 2019. Now, and I think that as we sit here today, people are more positive this year than they were last year. How do you guys feel about that? I agree. 
I agree. And if I look at the projects that are going to launch or launching soon, um, that's where we're going to see the long-term viability, both on the institutional side as well as more of the infrastructure side. So everyone talks about these projects which are going to launch or, or launching soon. Specifically, which projects excite you that, that, that show you that there's real building and adoption happening in this industry? Um, well, I, mean, I, I think Maker has been a really interesting in experiment um, that uh, we, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out how do you run a, an algorithmic stablecoin and will it work? And, and, and so, I mean, Definity is another one that, that you know, everyone's waiting to see when it will launch, whether it will launch. Um, and then I'm sure you know, my colleagues up here have others that um, they're looking to so, Paul, she mentioned that she didn't participate in any of the ICOs. Did you guys at Pentera participate in ICOs? We're investing in scaling solutions, and uh, at that point, not only Bitcoin, but other uh, use cases are going to knock the cover off the ball. So, guys, I'm going to point to you guys over there, because I think we've kept the conversation very much here, but what's the investment thesis? Right now, we, we have a very strong belief that everything will be tokenized, um, and through that, we have a lot of faith in the infrastructure. Um, in order for everything that to be tokenized and to be traded, and in derivative products that come from that, we have to put a lot of energy behind projects that are creating the infrastructure to allow the pipes and plumbing for things to be used um, across various exchanges, um, different OTC desks, um, even the, how we source information. So I want, I want to get into audience questions, but before that, I want to ask you guys specifically for one or two projects, either existing projects or uh, when I say existing listed projects or non-listed projects that you guys are really excited about. And the idea is not to speculate on the price, but to try and understand fundamentally why you're excited about them. Um, so one of our, our earliest investments was uh, in, <clears throat> uh, in a project called VeChain. Um, I think that uh, they've been actually progressing really well um, over the past few years in terms of developing their product, in terms of sort of hardware compatibility, and in terms of building uh, corporate partners. So VeChain. VeChain. Mm -hmm. So as a hedge fund manager, I have a shorter term view. So one of the things I would say is that we've seen Bitcoin go from about 50% of market share to 57%. I don't think people are going to leave. I think Bitcoin will remain the juggernaut for, let's say, the next month. No one's price predictions are good after that. Um, and then after like Bitcoin price stable, stabilizes, we'll see altcoins rising. So in the last couple of days, one of my favorite projects, Basic Attention Token, has been dipping. I think it's gone down 11% in the last day or something like that. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, the founder of Basic Attention Token, who also founded JavaScript and the Brave browser. So the fundamentals of BAT are strong. I'll also say that I like the blockchain interoperability projects like Cosmos and Polkadot. So I would uh, s definitely look at those as well. Mm -hmm. Matt? Uh, we're a big fan of INDX uh, right now. Uh, they are launching basically a masternode fund that is calculating which is the best nodes that are to stake. Um, and so I think it just is going to do a lot, of the get, take a lot of the guesswork out for people who want to be involved in that process. Um, and second project, I think, like like a lot of people here, we're really really excited. Personally, I'm really excited about Bitcoin, especially with the halving coming up. Um, I think people are really n underestimating the influence that has on the reward structure and the economics that go behind mining. So uh, it, that's inevitable, and that's coming, and if we should price that in. Paul, I'm really interested to hear what you're going to say here. Well, for those that are familiar with our firm, uh, you wouldn't be surprised if, uh, if I chose Augur. Uh, because be Joey, Joey, your chief investor. <laughs> well, we, 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 we happen to know it well. It, uh, <laughs> Augur is a, for those of you unaware, it's a prediction market, but other than just betting on who's going to win the NBA championship or playoffs or who's going to win the next election. It also is a platform, potentially, uh, that could really disrupt capital markets as we know them. So, All right, so your pick of the year. Oh, a pick of the year. Well, I'm a much longer term investor. Pick so. of the next five years. <laughs> so I, yeah, um, so I, I launched our uh, first fund in 2014 uh, and started investing in companies like Abra, BitPesa, um, blockchain, which is the largest crypto wallet in the world, um, uh, in 2014. So can you give me one project that you're super excited about? <laughs> well, out of our portfolio, I mentioned three. Okay. Um, I mean, I mentioned Maker, which we're not an investor in, but I, I, you know, I think this whole idea of, of, um, of open finance and peer-to-peer and -peer finance and being able to you know, create new financial instruments in a more decentralized way, watching all of that closely, and I think there are a lot of really smart minds working on those. Great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much yeah. to our panelists. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs>
Christian. Christian, Christian, buddy, come sit over here. Now, the advertising offers have been flooding in. Look at the pile of offers I've got here for you. Look, let's just take a pic. Picture this, you're hiking through the Rocky Mountains, okay? And you're carrying gorgeous rosewood designer door on your back. And you uh, look into the camera and then you say, oh. No. No, yeah, you're right. It's terrible, terrible idea. For the next one, you'll be carrying a refrigerator on your back, environmentally friendly refrigerator, and then your, your line is, uh, well, actually, it's just one word. Um, we'll put that one on ice, okay, yeah. Uh, ah, oh, this is a hot dog chain. You're carrying this huge hot dog on your- Enough! I've had it. No more carrying, no more saying that word ever again. I'm, I'm a serious actor. I have depth. Why can't you get me something with like an office with a tie, for example? Action! Bitcoin is crashing! We have to sell Bitcoin before Bitcoin is a rent. bubble! Huddle. 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 I have to find a new agent. From the High Line, we return to Ethereal. Let's hear from our contributor, Lindsay Drew, how it's going and who's building on Ethereum. Thank you, Ran. I'm here in a beautiful courtyard. We're at the Ethereal Summit in Brooklyn, New York, and we want to take a look at who's here today. It's a different field. There are developers, there are institutions, there are regulators. Let's go on inside and talk to some more people. We have projects that are built on Ethereum, other big projects like Microsoft Orchid. Let's go in and take a look. All right, so what have we got here? We are Virtue Poker. We are a safe, secure way of playing online poker. We are unstoppable domains. We build domains on blockchains. Uh, and the idea is that if you have a blockchain domain, it will be controlled by you. It'll be sitting inside of your wallet, and you can build an uncensorable website, a website that only you can take down. Okay, and what have you got here, York? Oh, this is, uh, I, you know, I keep encouraging the Xbox team to really get on board with, like, NFTs and... Um, tokens, and so this is uh, our blockchain booth with uh, the Xbox in it. So, okay. um, we figured if we brought Xbox on board to the Ethereal Summit, that we'd actually encourage Phil Spencer and his Xbox team to get on board with the tokens. So, okay, coming soon, I'm sure. Yeah. So, Sean, you're with Consensus. Tell me about Ethereal Summit today. Ethereal Summit is the beginning of Crypto Spring. Uh, we <laughs> we see kind of a convergence of people from all over the ecosystem coming into New York, descending on New York, kind of sharing their latest and greatest ideas. Uh, today we've partnered with, uh, with Shree and Holy Cow, who manufacture skincare products for uh, cosmetics and beauty. And we are using the blockchain to give provenance and transparency to the claims that they're providing uh, to the, about the product. I'm not coming in from a dev side, so seeing this realm of crypto is very interesting for me, and um, I really enjoy the whole fundamentalist attitude. It's, a, it's definitely a nice change of pace. Tell me about Breaker. So Breaker is a blockchain entertainment platform that allows artists to distribute their content, their feature-length films, their TV shows, their music albums, directly to their fans while using smart contracts to automate royalty and residual payouts, the stuff that they'd often have to rely on intermediaries or larger teams to do for them. What's going on at Ethereum Summit today, Ijaz? Today we're going to showcase a bunch of things regarding to in, uh, Ethereum infrastructure scaling, um, we're doing to Ethereum's um, Sort of commodities layer, digital asset infrastructure, as well as all the fun stuff. We're looking at like kind of statistics around Alethio, supply chain stuff with Vine, and a host of other services. Are you one of the nonprofits? So yes. Yeah, so my nonprofit um, that I work for is Black Girls Code. We're definitely trying to um, diversify this ecosystem that we're in, right? So we're excited that Black Girls Code was invited by the consensus team um, and also by Ethereum, um, trying to help us bridge the gap of diversity and inclusion. So that's what's happening with some of the Ethereum community. To wrap up, let's talk to Tushar Jain, who was just speaking on a panel about Layer 1 versus Layer 2. He's bullish. We're an active investor in this space. Tushar, it was great to yeah. see you. I, I must say, I didn't understand much of that panel. I'm sure you can talk, <laughs> talk to me about it here. But 
As a general thesis, we hear at the Ethereal Summit, are you still bullish on Ethereum? I think Ethereum is in a very interesting spot right now. Um, so I think that for Ethereum to succeed, we need to see the success of Layer 2 platforms um, because I think that Ethereum is seeing a tremendous amount of competition at Layer 1. A lot of projects are launching this year uh, that provide a better Layer 1 developer experience or better throughput. And they just have a lot of money and a lot of smart people working to compete with Ethereum. So if Ethereum is going to you know, keep the lead and stay ahead of all of these new platforms that are launching, I think we need to see Layer 2 really take off. Can Layer 2 be a good substitute for Layer 1? What I'm, what I'm asking is, can you have a, not a bad Layer 1, but a suboptimal Layer 1 and a very good Layer 2? And can that beat a very good Layer 1? Potentially, yes. Um, and it's because the best technology does not always win, right? Uh, community. Community. Uh, layer 2 development yeah. tools. Well, also, another big thing that Ethereum has in its favor is that it is definitively not a security, as per the SEC, right? Whereas no other projects have yet gotten that official designation, right? Uh, and everyone is working on making sure that they fit underneath the same exemption that the SEC seems to have created for Ethereum that is likely going to work. We will see. I think the SEC should hopefully release you know, some more official guidance, but that's, that is a, a big advantage that Ethereum has. Yeah, and obviously the, the big community and the fact that Ethereum does have users. Like it or not, today Ethereum has users. You mentioned that there are some platforms that are better on Layer 1. Yeah. If you were to, to talk about some of the, the, the platforms that are better on Layer 1, which ones yeah. are they? Uh, so one that we're invested in that is uh, one of my favorite Layer 1 platforms is called Solana. Yeah. Um, and I really like this platform specifically because of um, some of the technical decisions that they have made that allow for multi-threaded validation of transactions. Yeah. Rather than right now, all of these blockchains are single-threaded computers. And Solana is the first multi-threaded computer or multi-threaded blockchain that so has been created. Is Solana on mainnet yet? It's not, it's not yet on mainnet. It is not yet on mainnet. It's currently on testnet. We've actually played with the testnet ourselves, um, and it, it works really well. Um, and we are expecting mainnet launch pretty soon. And other layer one platforms that could be seen as uh, competitors to Ethereum that are in mainnet? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, there's a number of smart contract platforms that are already live, uh, I think. The most well-known are going to be platforms like Tezos or ELS, Tron, um, Cosmos. Uh, those are those are the at least the top market cap and, and most well-known smart contract platforms competing directly with Ethereum. Let's talk about Ethereum's migration from proof of work to proof of stake. That's part yeah. of what they're calling Ethereum 2.0. First of all, are you confident that it's, they're going to put it off in a, in a timely manner? I mean, they're talking about doing it potentially towards the end of the year. Oh, it, the thing by the end of the year was just the beacon chain. That is not Ethereum 2.0. That is a significant milestone on the way to Ethereum 2.0, but um, that is not going to actually be the solution. And now, Tushar, yeah. before I let you go, your partner in crime, uh, one of the partners in your fund, Vinny yeah. Lingham, said that if Bitcoin breaks 6,200, he's a bull. Yep. Bitcoin broke 6,200. Are you a bull? Uh, I'm very bullish on Bitcoin in the long term. I think um, in, I'm very bullish on Bitcoin in the medium term as well. The short term, this price action has been straight up for quite a while. Um, and markets just don't go straight up. Yeah. There, there are always corrections along the way. Now, the last time we met, uh, we spoke in depth about XRP. Just wondering if you've changed your views about XRP and whether you think it's a, a big buy right now. Absolutely not. <laughs> um, I, I retain my views on XRP. Uh, you know, full disclosure, we are still short XRP. We've been short for quite some time. Um, and we expect that as Ripple Inc. continues to sell their XRP on the market and soak up any, any new buying, um, that the, the price will continue to stay. Calling the XRP army. Calling the XRP army. You can find Tushar Jain on Twitter. Tushar, it's been a great pleasure having you on, on Crypto Twitter. brings to an end the first part of our coverage of New York City Blockchain Week and it's been all about Ethereum. I'd love to hear your take on Ethereum. I'll be on Twitter at CryptoManRun.
and you should trade well, my friends. Crypto Trader is proudly brought to you by eToro. Discover a simpler way to trade and invest in cryptocurrencies and more.